All right, everybody, today we are talking about Simple Chess by Michael Steen. This is a rediscovered book, at least for me, and I'll talk a little bit about how I think it's been rediscovered um, towards the end of the show. But when I was a kid, wasn't even aware of it. I read a lot of books as a, as a kid, but I wasn't aware of it. Now, I'm ultimately going to very much recommend this book, but I want to make a couple criticisms, and I have to begin with a criticism because we have to think about like what is the book about. The book is called Simple Chess, and it's a little bit unclear about what the design of the book is doing, right? Are we, do we have like a programmatic, systematic thing where we're talking about the elements of the game in some strategic sense, or do we just have a nice collection of games that are well annotated? And I think part of the problem is it's definitely the latter. Very uh, good selection of interesting positional struggles, and the annotations really give some depth, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second. Um, but the idea that there's something called simple chess and, and that you could then, through this book, learn about some elements of the game through uh, that and break it down and have some kind of systematic approach I don't see that as a reader. Um, so even though I think the fundamental premise, the selling point of the book, and this might have been the fault of the editors, even though that didn't come through, um, I still think the book is very promising. And let's start with then a couple positions. So for example, <clears throat> this is a great game. This is Fisher Petrosian from their 1971 match. And um, this, first of all, great annotations, um, and there's this really interesting moment that people have written dissertations on, I kid you not. Uh, we don't have dissertations because we're not as dumb as academics, but you know what I mean? People have thought about the following sequence of moves. All right, so this is a little weird, but we get it. The dude wants to play bishop d7 to bring his bishop out. Okay, rook e5, bishop d7, and Fisher takes. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to pause here it illustrates a couple things. First, the move definitely deserves two exclamation points because most players would never dream of taking the bishop. Never even dream of taking the bishop because it's so-called, uh, it looks like a bad bishop. And it really ushers in a whole new way of thinking about the bishop and in particular what we could call the Fisher endgame, which is a rook and bishop versus rook and knight. And interestingly, right, the match before this versus time and off was the first time, two games in that match, where we get the classic Fisher ending. We're definitely getting in this one too. Uh, this one's especially interesting because you can imagine there's more than one way for white to play the position and then pop. <laughs> so first of all, I think it was such a new thing at the time that I don't even think Steen understood it. And it take, it's taken generations for really us to appreciate how, how deep this conception was. And, and this is not the time to talk about it, but you know maybe I'll do another lecture on it. There's other things you can find on the Fisher Endgame out there too. Okay. One of the reasons I want to highlight this is that if someone were to write a systematic uh, book about positional play, then one chapter should be, hey, Fisher Endgame, right? And so one of the things that I look for in these books, just for my own selfish interests, is uh, does the author show me something in clear writing about that I can take away and use in my own games and thinking about the game? So that's just an interesting example. And one of the reasons I, I wanted to also show this example is the games, or really a lot of them from the 60s and 70s, and this book originally came out in 78, great collection of positional games. This, this being a real classic. Now, one of the things that I want to say about it, even though, like, for example, if you take a look at the table of contents, you know, uh, it's like outposts, weak pawns, open files, and there's just seven of them. And, we're, and it ends with space. And we're going to talk about space at the end. Contrast that to my system, or maybe a newer version of my system, which would like reassess your chess, which is like a loads of chapters, which I don't know as a reader that I need it to be systematic, but I, I want insight, right? And so if it's going to sell me as a systematic thing, I want it boom, 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 and give me interesting words 
to um, help understand what's going on. For example, instead of a weak pawn or isolated queen pawn, I love how Nimzovich says the isolated queen pawn and its descendants, right? Which then turns you on to the fact that hanging pawns have a lot of the same dynamics as isolated queen pawns, as an example. Okay, uh, let's move on. And um, the next example is we're going to talk about space. So the final chapter is space. And one of the interesting things about space, okay, is it's really after Fisher in the Karpov era that the chess world really turns to thinking about space. And in fact, before I even do this, I'm gonna, I was going to do a different order, but I'm going to start here. So the standard rotary position, especially back in the day, this happened thousands of times. You can still see it sometimes today. Um, in this position, black can play all kinds of moves. Rook e8, bishop d7, bishop b7, knight c6, you know, even cd. But if they don't play cd, white will not basically have a choice. And Fisher really always played something like de, and then for knight f1, and then one of these moves, depending on what uh, black did. In fact, in the Queen's Gambit series, there's a nice knight d5 cameo appearance of a Fisher game with the Zippon sack. Um, and I did a lecture years ago at the St. Louis Chess Club about why Fisher didn't want to play for space. Maybe he wasn't very good at it. It was definitely a weird defect in his game compared to the later players. Whereas then Karpov, and there's a great example in this book, um, of would play happily this d5 structure. D5 plays for space, knight f1, DE and knight f1 plays for active piece play, right? Completely different positions. So, right, like after this book, or right, kind of in the midst of this book, Karpov is developing this new way of playing for space. And then, of course, now with computers, <laughs> the computers love space. Oh, buddy, they really like it. They will make you think that DE is a mistake here, whereas for me, you know, I don't know. They both look very interesting. Um, and one of the things with computers, too, is they're much better at playing with space, and playing with space is one of the hardest things to learn as a chess player um, for GMs and everybody else alike. It's very hard to master the skills you need for playing with space. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it when we get to the next example. Um, okay, so I think that the reason this book was rediscovered was this position, uh, and that's because in that uh, positional decision-making in chess here by Gelfand, okay, um, what we see is this position, uh, which, by the way, I used to get on the, I played the Hustler's on the lake in Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, and there was one hustler, and we had thousands of games, and he always did this. And I knew that this was better for white. It was very hard to win against the hustler, especially. But um, Gelfand's like, bro, this position is, is actually positionally lost. And so that was mind blowing to me. Now, Gelfand steals this position from Steam. And what is the clever thing that Steen does? Just one page in the book. And he shows this position. And then he says, all right, White's obviously doing great here. But then let's switch it up to this position. And then ask ourselves, how do we feel about this position? And the word he uses is that White doesn't have the capacity to fill his space. So you might even want to use the word negative space. Like White needs the miners to control the space that he has. Without it, black can become better. And then it's really astonishing, because then you look at this position. Um, I haven't turned on the computer, but in just my own estimation, I think black has several moves. But b5, cb, a6, beautiful position for black. I would say black is slightly better. And so there's this fascinating thing, right, where when we go back to this position, you start taking pieces off the board, and it goes from white being positionally better, or positionally winning in the eyes of Gelfand, to white being worse. Fascinating, <laughs> okay? Fascinating, obviously a high concept 
thing that's hard for us mortals to understand and even harder to play. Because, you know, a lot of the moves is about domination. You're not attacking, you're just responding, you're trying to control. Okay, so my two cents here, <laughs> is what I gotta give it, I'm sorry, I gotta give my two cents, <laughs> is that the best way to think about space, cry, this isn't about you, buddy, what are you doing? Any case, this is another position from the book, great example, Smyslav Goodmanson from like 1970-something. And obviously we can talk about space, but the thing that I think, and that this is kind of where Gelfand is going with it too, but in my own words, space is about controlling the minor pieces. Gelfand makes a great point that space is actually about uh, the minor pieces and not the heavies. The heavies find their way out as the rooks are going to find their way out to E8 here. And so in instead of saying space, you say, does, does, do you or your opponent have bad pieces? And so in this case, I think it's the knight on A5, which is destroying the black's, black's position. And then Smyslov plays a great attack on the king where he is up a piece on that side of the board, right? I'm just hoping that's helpful. One of the reasons, though, I want to maybe bring it up or rationalize me bring it up is that still today, it's, we're still struggling with space. Like the debate does, hasn't ended about what's going on. And then the computers just make it so much more difficult. And one thing that was interesting about this um, aggressive repertoire for white that is gonna come out in Chessable in a little bit that I've got going is I deliberately chose a repertoire where we are not playing for space. And if you turn on the computer, the computer is always gonna want you to play for space, but I know that that is difficult for everybody, whether you're a GM or a chump or whatever, right? It's difficult to play for space. And so kind of like Fisher, I'm like, I'm gonna avoid, <laughs> I'm gonna avoid positions where I have the spatial advantage. Okay, so I wanna wrap it up there and say what was, uh, not only did Gelfand bring this book back up, but I think maybe because of Gelfand, then Ben Johnson from the Perpetual Chess Podcast got turned onto the book. He loves the book. And he, in our podcast of the best chess books that came out quite recently, he said this was, I think, number three in terms of top 10 chess books of all time. Very interesting uh, claim. I don't agree with it, but I was happy that he said it and that I read the book. Very instructive book to read. Um, it kind of also, and I want to talk about the strengths of the book for a second. Um, with the, the annotated games, uh, what you can see is the elements that I would associate with like the things you should name in a book about strategy. They're in there, but they're in the annotations. I don't feel like they're in any kind of systematic way, but they're here and there through, sprinkled throughout the book. And a lot of the books that we have in the Chess Dota training program, this being one of them, we have good annotated games, classics like this, um, that people can play through. And one of the curious arguments that we had when we were talking about best books is, uh, do we talk, are we talking about best books of all time in some kind of classic sense? Or are we talking about certain books for certain ratings? And I think for a lot of people, they're like, cry, what are you talking about classics? That makes no sense at all. You know, there's different uh, rating groups for different areas. And maybe, but I wanna say like, even though we're putting this into, I think, the 1600 band, uh, our 1600 cohort, I love this book. And so in any, you know, it, as long as it tells me something, there's some kind of insight that a book gives me, I don't think it matters too much uh, what rating level you're at. Maybe you could argue that with puzzles. You could say, well, some puzzles are easier than others. In any case, clear thinking goes together with clear writing, and there's definitely some clear writing here in the annotations. So a very good book, part of the Chess Dojo training program. Check out Ben Johnson's uh, Chess Podcast. He's gonna talk more about that book there. Also, he's gonna have a book about chess improvement coming out in the fall, I believe, and so I'm sure this book is gonna be talked about in that tome as well. All right, bye. <laughs>